the gladius, the kelenius, the bedrias, If you listen to the wind, the you will hear the names of the original the Métis Nats, families who lived on Moccasin Flats. This area was home to a group of shacks precariously perched on the banks of Windrum Creek in Chetwind, formerly known as Little Prairie. This is where, when they talked about uh, Coutre's there, this was their house, wasn't it? Coutre. Yeah, Coutre family lived right here. The Coutre family lived here, which was Pat and Florence Coutre, and you can see them in the Moxon Flats. They were, uh, I think they said there was like 16 of them in the, 14. In the little house. So this is where they lived, right behind the Legion here. And none of those tra none of those trailers were there, eh? Like no, that Legion sub no, wasn't there. Not, that was all bush. That was the, their houses here, right? Yeah, about where we're standing. And we'll go up where there is just up the hill here is where my grandma Marceline lived, where I lived and was raised. I'm trying to figure out today, I think we moved here in 1960. Everybody, we squatted up here. We, nobody owned their properties. So you can see we're climbing this little hill here. Our road used to Wasn't be- Wasn't this the road here? No, the road is right here, Lee. That didn't go past further to anything. So as you can see, as we're going, you can see where our road was. It was a dangerous road, <laughs> but it's the only road we had. As you can see, this was the road here. And then we climb up here. And maybe we'll go up here because this is where I lived with my grandma. I didn't realize they cleared it this far because everybody else lived that way. Now it's just all a park. So I think the only thing we could see is where we used to live, which was in this area here. But there's no paths, no morabilia, no nothing I can go on. But this is the exact spot where we lived from 1960. I was just trying to do my math. So I think 1960, and then we moved to Wabi Preston in 1971. There was a place when I was younger. We just called it Moggers and Flats. We had no power running water in the winter we melted snow to take a bath well it was like a tar paper shack i guess you'd say it was not much insulation it was uh, cold in the winter time you had to keep the fire going have lots of firewood and, and no running water it's, pr it's pretty hard pretty hard struggle Today the houses are all gone An airport stands where we once lived We all in, 19, in about 1977, I was very, very fortunate to get the original Moggison Flats 1 film. It was on 16 millimeter film and I showed it to all the people in Sesame Street in that house right over there. Bill and Betty, no, sorry, Phil and Betty Gladue owned that home. And so all the kids were all scattered around and there were adults and we watched the uh, original Magus and Flats one video. It was exciting for them. They saw themselves 
figure skating, they saw themselves jumping. It was an incredible video. And it was momentous in a way too, and historical. This road here is the original Moccasin Flats road into what was the airport and also Rotary Park. So this was the in and out of the entire area. Sesame Street, somewhere loggers, somewhere trappers, panic and moose meat was a favorite food. There were hard times. It wasn't no streets or nothing, it was just like, it was a flat. <laughs> That's why they called it Moccasin Flats. <laughs> There was Indians all the way around, it was all flat. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but it's true. My grandmas were my doctors. And uh, yeah, I remember being a, as a child, I was, I was happy. Mm -hmm. We didn't have running water, we had a wood stove and a well. A well, it was all good. What just street just you uh, my grandma. Oh was yeah, it? I was born on uh, Bannock Street and Stovepipe Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> I was, when they were born, I was outside listening in the back, eh? And my grandma was there uh, delivering the them. Eh? I was just back by the woodpile. Heard my mom just screaming, eh? I didn't know what the heck was going on. It was a nice community. Everybody helped each other. You know, everybody helped each other. And if you needed help, like neighbors help, they come and help you all the time. You know, that's, uh, there was no rush, and nothing rushing, you know, it was, uh, yeah, there's a lot of help. A lot of, a uh, lot of, lot, actually love there. There was, there was love there, put it that way. That's it today, it's not going to be moving on. But try to listen a little closer. And what do you hear? You can hear stories in Cree and English of how these families planned the move and helped build their own homes. You will hear of the challenges they faced, the words of townspeople who doubted their tenacity in staying the distance with the housing project. Of course, some of the people of Chetwin Maybe even some who mingled with the Moccasin Flats folk decently enough around a public bonfire, because after all it was Christmas, predicted disaster. The Indians couldn't pull it off, they said. They'd start it, but they couldn't finish it. Wait and see. There were, let it be said, a lot of people in Chetland who only barely bought the mayor's financial arguments, who really didn't want to see the town discolored. said we'll never make it, we'll never do nothing, we'll not uh, uh, do anything, we won't succeed, that's the word I was looking for, succeed, we'll fail. How did that get make you guys feel? No, just... It made us more obligated to live a better life. The story starts well before 1971, with many letters and phone calls exchanged between Victoria and Ottawa by the Mayor and Council of Chetland to MLAs, MPs, and bureaucrats. The goal was to find the best housing program for Métis families and to give their children equal opportunity to education, sports, health care, and jobs in the future. It, it was, uh, it's a happy time. You know, for the kids now, they had a big voice because the reason why the housing actually was developed is, is for the kids to get educated. Prior to that, there wasn't one Aboriginal kid ever graduated from Chetland School, mm -hmm. ever. His wife did a lot in the community. I yeah, remember we used to have a little, you know, we went in the basement, we had to wrap all these gifts, Christmas gift before 
Joe Embry came along with this load, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, taking them to the community and uh, yeah. have a Christmas party, a Christmas gathering for in the, all of them. In the middle of the town with the yeah. great big bonfire. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. He showed up there in his uh, skidoo, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe Ms. Embry. That, that's yeah. in the video. Part yeah. Of Mrs. Mrs. Oberly and I, a few ladies. Oh, we had to wrap and wrap and wrap all you night. You bought yourself a ticket for a train you'll never ride. You covered up your... For the Métis people, this opportunity was a road to a bright future. But for Chetwin's mayor, Frank Oberly, this meant putting his neck on the line. He immediately agreed to, well, the land, there was lots of land up there and not doing anything. So we flew home, I flew home on on cloud nine and of course proudly proclaimed to my council that we get the greatest idea that ever came across my desk and every one of them all five of them uh, in unison declared it the craziest idea they ever seen none of them could see the economic benefit to the municipality 32 new houses in a community of 800 people or a thousand people at best all of them guaranteed by cmhc and, and uh, you know, how could, how could it possibly fail? Well, one of them piped up, nobody ever built me a goddamn house, of course. And, uh, you know, so the old, uh, you know, the old attitudes of, of, you know, some of these things bring out the best and the meanest spirits in people. And my council was possessed with the, with the latter. Frank was the one that did a lot of work. I have, I have, I have to give him a lot of credit. And, uh, and and him and his wife putting their he put his uh, career on the line I would say when he did that even when he wrote the book that even so more when the, when he did that and but it was good for people in general because his 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 heart was for the people eh? and that's what he did and and for us it was, made it so good that from there we were growing today this is the, what the second generation of people that are growing, they're going forward, they're being independent, they're have, getting educated and having jobs and, and looking after their families today. So that's that's the outcome of it for me. Did you find a lot of racism in Chatwin? Oh yeah, sure, of course, yeah. So anyway, uh, and, and that's basically what, what, uh, what we're fighting. But anyway, it, uh, rather than, than go into details of, of what it took at one time, my council, when I was out of town, uh, managed to cancel the project and inform the province that the council cannot support it. So the, can the project was canceled and I had to restart it right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just unbelievable to get it through. And I finally informed my council, look, this project will happen, whether you like it or not, or whether it has to go over my dead body, this is what we will do. Thankfully, the risk paid off. By 1971, these families were given an incredible opportunity from the federal government, a first of its kind in Canada. They called it a co-op project. They were given mortgages to build new homes in a subdivision called Wabi Crescent. Jean Riome phoned me. He was an executive, a native, incidentally, from Manitoba. He was a senior position with CMHC. He said, look, uh, I have a call from Ron Bassford, and he wants me to work with you on this crazy idea you have about building houses in Chetwin. He said, I want to come out right away because uh, this is the idea is too good. We can't wait to these sons of bitches in Ottawa to change their mind. So out they came with Louise Hayes. I don't know whether you remember her. Uh, uh, and I got a call from Vancouver. We wanted to go down to Victoria first to assure that the, the provincial government is tuned in because they would have to supply the land and, uh, and basically agree with the project. We, uh, we, we got together and we worked with Frank Oberly to kind of guide us through the whole uh, applying for that, uh, that land and the housing. And I didn't realize that we were the first Aboriginal group across Canada to be able to work with CMHC. I didn't know that till way later that uh, that we were the first Aboriginal group to work with CMHC. 
In this house to our left was Philip and Betty Gladue. And I do believe they were the first ones to get a phone. Oh, to get a phone down yeah. There? yeah, get a rotary phone. So that's where we made all our phone calls from. <laughs> yeah. We all went there, we had to pay 10 cents. 10 cents? <laughs> Well, they must have got rid of, rich out of those dimes because they now live in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and so I called a few of the native leaders together and a few of the, the uh, community leaders like Father Youngblood, the doctor, and John and Ruth Lennox, uh, and, uh, you know, some people that, that I could trust to, to have some vision about this thing. And we laid out, a, uh, we, dis we, we discovered a an idea that, that I thought was worth pursuing. And that was that we, we establish a, a housing corporation. We invite eligible families to it. And uh, they would all work on the project and uh, build their own houses with the help, of course, of uh, professional plumbers and electricians and a couple of carpenters that would teach them the trade on the way, on the way along. And uh, we, would, uh, we would pay them or credit them with three dollars for every hour they worked on the project and the three dollars would be the down payment and at the end they would own they would own their house and they would have a, a an additional mortgage on it but whether cmhc subsidizes the mortgage or the rent is really immaterial but the right of ownership you know which none of them had ever experienced uh, was an important building block in, in improving your social condition, in my view, anyway. I want to stand my life. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> There's a lot of fun, a lot of friends. Three or four people in every house, boys and girls and everything. We had a blast. Everybody had things to do all the time. We, we had a lot of fun. <clears throat> Nobody owned much. But we all got together and just had a blast. Hey, man. We had something to do every night, every day. Just playing. Just playing. Oh, the actual original park was actually located in, in behind uh, Bill and Blanche Gladys place in between the, in between. the corner of the street and in, in back of the bush. Everything was all wood, trees, made out of wood and trees. It's wood, whatever the workers could scrap together. Uh, that's what our playground was. So a lot of slivers back when we were kids. Uh, slides were a little tough, but <laughs> that's what made us tough. Although officially the neighborhood was called Wabi Crescent, the residents seemed fond of the name Sesame Street. I believe probably about, I'd say, Five years after we we incorporated here, uh, with the, myself, um, got a cousin Ernie, and there was a Bert down the street. My mother was uh, referred to as Big Bert. She was a tall lady, and that uh, all of a sudden uh, Sesame Street was. I, I I actually don't ever remember it not being it not being referred to as Sesame Street. So. Did you take it negatively or positively? I took it positively. It was, it was always in humor for me. It was always in humor. So, being that I'm Oscar, uh, yeah, I always was almost a little prideful, little tidbit that I'd relay to people that I met in town. I'm from Sesame Street. I'm Oscar. My experience with the term Sesame Street was kind of hilarious in a way. A man over there, his name is Ron, he was the first one to actually explain to me a little bit about Sesame Street. His bus bird. And so when the insurance adjuster came out to see him, Ron turned around and was asked the question, where were you in the trailer, your, your trailer, your bus bird? He turned around and said, I was at Sesame Street. And the man said, what? He says, yes, I was drinking beer with Big Bird. He just lived down the road. Then he says, what? He says, yes, Bert and Ernie were there. Oscar wasn't there. Oscar was somewhere else. So the nickname Sesame Street has an affectionate side to it. 
and that affection actually goes for over years and years. Played on the streets, the kids, the grew groups, 50 we played in the bush. We just we lived in the bush when we lived in Mogs and Flats. We went to Sesame Street. We actually had lights. Wasn't many, but the far end of Sesame Street was all bush. We went, did anything. We played the whole street. All the kids played together. My mom repaired all the bikes for the kids. She was the one that your bike broke down. Mom repaired it. She just, it was, we played street hockey. We played kick the can. Every, every kind of game you can think of. Anti, anti, I over. Things that the kids don't do nowadays. We're always outside. But I've left something out. There's a house in Moccasin Flats where 14 people live in three small rooms. From paper thin walled tar shacks which didn't have power or running water, these families endorsed a plan to relocate build and to move into newly constructed homes. These new homes would come with city water, sewer, and electricity. I'm gonna build me a dream, gonna build it with my heart. There's a voice deep inside me saying, make a brand new start. Make a brand new stone I see a new day coming And it's coming very fast And I've wondered if I want this For I'm haunted by the past Yes, I'm haunted by the past There's love in my house to keep me satisfied My dreams can't be shattered by the stormy times of life Yes, I see a new day coming, it's coming very fast And I've wondered if I want this for I'm haunted by the past For my children, for I know it's gonna last. But I find myself looking through the window of the past. Through the window of the past. Yes, I see a new day coming, and it's coming very fast. And I wondered if I want this for I'm haunted by the past. Yes, I'm haunted by the past. Mortgage payments will cost about $120 a month. The estimated monthly hydro bill is $12 to $15. Gas for the furnace, another $20, 2 to $3 for water. And for many families, the total costs almost equal what they were paying back at the flats. They offered small municipalities like ours uh, to get in partnership with them and, uh, and, and establish uh, low rental housing units that the native people could could live in, you know, uh, modern units that would have running hot and cold water, of course, and so on. There's been uh, a lot of pride taken in uh, in some of the homes. Other homes have, uh, you know, uh, I guess give myself a little push. Thank goodness they were built strong enough. They're still looking pretty good. And uh, there's been quite a bit of work done by others in the homes, uh, new kitchens and uh, stucco and siding and things have been repaired, new siding. Houses have had some additions on and uh, yeah, I, I believe the community's been a good one. 
I see a new day coming And it's coming very fast And I wonder if I want this For I'm haunted by the past Yes, I wonder if I want this For I'm haunted by the past We were one of the first families to move into that community, I remember. Our, uh, my mom and dad's house. We, in fact, the small irony, they still live in that same house, my parents. The first house on the right, as after the bridge, I always used to tell my friends, um, 4,700, you know. I remember them dancing. I remember the, the Indian dancers on there. And, but I didn't know who they were, but I remember us kids, little kids running around and all this excitement was happening in the air. And, and it was inauguration, you know, they built the, the basement side of, up to the top. I remember that. And I remember us as kids playing in the bathroom and all flushing it and going, wow, flush it again, flush it again. You know, that was so cool that water comes back again, you know. So, you know, just those little basic necessities is, is still alive in, in, in where I am as a kid. When we first moved here, I thought it was a castle because it had everything in it, eh? water, lights. We had uh, bedrooms for the kids. It was different. It's excitement. I don't know how to explain it, but it was really something else for us we thought we'd never own. Uh, my dad was Harvey McFeeters. He was uh, kind of a no-nonsense, loud, gruff guy, and which actually led him to being uh, uh, kind of a foreman. It was a non-paying job, obviously, but it was a, a job that he took in pro with pride because he helped organize each and every Every family member that worked on their house, he he kept track of uh, hours because you had to have you had to show the time that you put into into your house and stuff. And he was he was a part of uh, well, he was the the uh, main organizer of that. So it was uh, it was a prideful thing to see in the uh, the book that I read with uh, Mr. Oberley. Uh, from Mogson Flats to Parliament Hill, that was to, to read my dad's name in there. I, I I read that with quite pride and showed what my dad was uh, capable of doing when he wanted to. Many nights when the Moberly sun was hanging low. Young man would come For me, it was I didn't know anything different, so I couldn't I couldn't judge it. I couldn't um, I couldn't give it uh, um, any type of uh, comparison to another another lifestyle. For me, it was just life in in, in itself, right? So I uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. it just, I, I still talk about it. We were um, we were talking about how that Bruce Springsteen song. When does it re come re relevant in our lives? Glory days. Right, and so as we get older, we start thinking about our past, right? Because when we're younger, we're just thinking about the next day. Now, now we're kind of reflecting and coming back, and and I remember those times, and it was times that you know I I wouldn't trade for the world. It was oh, absolutely, they were my, like no responsibility, no accountability, no no those types of things, right? You just go out, come home after school, go up with your friends, play hockey, do whatever you wanted to, and wait for the Moggison Telegraph, right? Come home, Spike! And, and my mom had, had such a distinct yell that people started mimicking her, right? So then they would be like, Spike, get the hell home right now! And I'd come running and she'd be like, I didn't call you. Kick, cut the grass. Kick, cut the grass. Go like this, kick, cut the grass. Kick, cut the grass. There, you're ready. You're ready for a happy song? Yupper. Say, hey, we're from Hawks and Flats. Last call. Whatever makes you happy.
As they speak of the change that came from Moccasin Flats to Wabi Crescent, they are contributors to a new life for dozens of children who made their way into the bigger world of Canada. We look at Darlene Campbell, and I think Darlene and her family have been a bridge between the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. I think I was blessed when I was um, adopted by my grandparents. It was the gift that I got from my grandparents is speaking Cree fluently uh, because I was around elders all my life and raised with them as a child since I was a child. I wish I could turn back the years of that, like the time, yes. you know, that turn back the clock and have my grandma back again. Because to this day, the memories will never, will no, ever go away. They're always there. My grandma worked very hard raising four of us after she raised all her nine kids and then, they, then she adopted four of us grandchildren. My grandma, for extra dollars, she used to make hides every day. It, all my life I could remember her making hides. As you can see on the one video, um, this is what she did for extra dollars to um, for us to put food on a table or forever what, for reason. I look at Marceline and I think she knows how to take the hair off a moose hide and soften it and ply it into supple, tough moccasins to last a man two years. And in the big cities, there are thousands of big and little kids who dream of learning how to do these things, of living close to the land getting away from the pavement and the broad loom and the colored stoves and toilets they grew up on and making it on their own, on the land. But Marceline and her Métis family and neighbors never chose to live this way. They had no choice. Not welcome in the towns. Jobs scarce for a Métis man. This life is normal for Marceline. It's not bad, she says. She makes her moccasins and beadwork, sometimes a coat. Babysits the grandchildren while the young people go away to work. And if they move into town, into this new project people are talking about, Marceline thinks that would be better. On the one hand, our story is sometimes bittersweet since some children and grandchildren died of violence drugs and alcohol. Uh, growing up here, I've, uh, I've seen a lot down the street. I've seen stuff that you shouldn't, shouldn't have to see as a kid, but uh, you, you see. My, my uncle got shot and, and killed. He, this was uh, back when I was an early teenager, just down at the end of the street. He was shot and killed and partying and and I've seen my neighbors, uh, six, seven, eight cops, ready to shoot, shoot him. And he was screaming to shoot me, shoot me. He wanted to go. And you know, you're a kid and you're seeing this. This is, this is stuff in the movies. And I've also been in a house where we kicked the guy out and he come back with a gun, started putting bullets through the house. <laughs> so that's, that was, uh, that's what we, I, we kind of grew up with. Um, but for me, this is home. This, this is, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. I remember going through my first man battle, I was 12 years old, you know, right back here. Three men beat me up. And to this day, I think about that, and, you know, and there's, that's the kind of world I lived in, those battles. And, you know, now I think about it and I'm like, holy man, it's funny, no one got killed, you know, that I was really close to, you know, like that, you know, violence. And, but uh, it was always sticking up for each other, you know, and helping. But it did get to that point, you know, with alcoholism, 
like throughout the street, you know, but that all done away with. And, you know, I'm glad my parents went to Christianity when I was uh, a young boy. I was uh, 11 when they started coming. My mom started believing. Twelve. And uh, I became a Christian at 12 and um, believed ever since. And it's been a hard struggle ever since, you know. I just, I believe, but I just got to stay My strong. Old friend, tell me how have you been? But on the other hand, our story is also one of personal success for many children and grandchildren. In fact, this story is of succession from Moccasin Flats to Wabi Crescent to all points in BC. From that, our kids graduated. That was the key thing. When the kids graduated, uh, where they were comfortable to study in the house with lights and warmth and running water, and they didn't have to do all that work. And, and it made a big difference. They graduated and they got educated and uh, started working at early age and, and still graduated. And that was awesome to see. You know, and I look at that, that the, the, you know, the, um, the documentary Mogs and Flats, and I always say to people, you know, there was one lady, there was just my great uncle's grandmother, well, I call her Cookham, Marceline was better known as. Um, she said, will it be worth it? She goes, I don't know in the end. I think there's successes and, and, and tragedies in every story and the good thing about a document like this is we're going to show the successes. We know a lot of our people what we went through in our history and where we've been and today we're, I think it's time to celebrate our successes and show that it was worth it because at the end of the day where would we have gone after if, Mog if the current community of Wabi Crescent aka Sesame Street wasn't built? Um, who knows because we were threatened to be kicked off that land. We asked Debbie Gladue, who in the original film of Moccasin Flats dances on the ice with her sister Sandra, how did a little Métis girl venture into the big city and succeed? So when we went to school, it was, I think it was just instilled in us uh, through maybe family interactions, like the whole family. And um, uh, we just carried that with us. All those values that maybe I didn't see as a child were instilled. So when I went to the community to go to school or participate in activities, I just, I knew I could do anything. My grandmother, actually, one of my grandmothers um, did not speak English. Did she speak? Oh, pardon me. She did not read English, sorry. She could speak, but um, I think of her now as very amazing because um, she could bake bannock. I've never seen bannock like that done before. It was fluffy and uh, I've never seen it. It was very beautiful. She could sew. Um, uh, she could tan a hide. <laughs> um, uh, and she was very loving to all of us grandchildren. Very loving person. Um, and that's, that stayed with me. And uh, like now today, if, like, you know, if I'm having a rough day, it's those kind of memories and those kind of values that have helped me become successful. But as I go back and I think of that, um, of, of the values that that community had, we look at Dean Gladu. We ask, how did your childhood and life in Wabi Crescent help you succeed? As I got older, I started to realize some of the things that I was taught as a young boy can now come into reality as a police officer. My culture, you know, being proud of who I am. My Muslim, Louis Gladu used to say, Napis, you know, Ayapeh, he would say, sit down, let me tell you. Never be ashamed of where you are and who you come, where you come from. Always be proud of where you come from. I never understood that. But then as I learned about the rebellion, you know, the Métis struggles, I started to understand later in life why he kept saying that to me. We discovered, you know, as the evolution of Canada goes through, that I had come from a very proud nation, a very proud peoples, and that's the Métis nation of Canada. And that comes from the Red River. We come from the, you know, the Lake St. Anne's and the different Métis settlements out there. 
Kelly Lake, and which is then our community became Mogus and Flats, which is a proud little community. But we never became a really structured, organized community. We just families just wong it day by day. We just, whatever we can find that day, if we found a little mouse running by, we shot it and cooked it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but maybe that's why I like chicken. No. <laughs> and, and KFC. No, I'm just, I think, and that's the other thing is the humor of our people too. Yeah. We ask Shelby Desjardins, now a successful business owner in Vancouver, who was a first generation resident of Wabi Crescent, what was your childhood like? Those close connections and coming home after school and, and being able to go out and just play and not have any worries or any responsibilities or any accountability and it helped us to create kind of a, a, a community, right? Not all of us were related, not all of us were, were close, but within that within that street there was a community there if somebody yelled hey spike it's time to come home another mother would yell and we call it the indian telegraph so you'd yell down the street until we got to the end of the creek where everybody was playing oh spike time to go home right so for me it was a way of life i didn't know any different and it was the best life i could have ever asked for we ask roland gansaflez what life was like Roland was in the original film as a small mixed blonde child who is dearly loved by his grandfather Louis Gladue. This was my grandpa's place, this one. So, and then that one was my uncle's, another uncle over there, another two more aunt and uncles over here. So just the whole family kind of lived here after they built the houses. Like everybody always, like my nicknames and everything were always good. Like even Chief Wooden Shoes they called me because dad was Dutch and so it was always fun. We ask Oscar McFeeters, who remains as a Métis leader in the community, why he stayed in Wabi Crescent. I, I remember now, uh, uh, probably about three years ago, rummaging through my attic. I was altering a light in one of the bedrooms and I come across a bag that was underneath the uh, uh, insulation up top and out of the bag, I pulled out uh, probably about 10 Christmas cards that were sent to my mother and my grandmother who were living in, in, in my house now. That was from all the members of the street. All the street used to give each other cards. It was uh, a very tight, tight knit uh, uh, street community. We all knew each other and uh, it's, it's sad to see a lot of them had moved away, but a lot of them gone on to bigger and better things. And it's, to me, this is home. I, I'm born and raised here, and they'll, they'll be spreading some of my ashes on some of these <laughs> driveways. But, uh, and there'll be lots of ashes to spread, so I can do a lot of driveways. 55 years later, everyone who was or still is part of this community honors this project as a gift. It's a gift that has touched the lives of many individuals, including those who are no longer with us to share their marvelous stories. There was a place when I was younger We just called it Moggers and Vlads We had no power Running water in the winter, we melted snow to take a bath. Some were loggers, some were trappers. Panic and moose meat was a favorite food. There were hard times, we shared what we had. We were one big family, me and you. Today the houses are all gone An airport stands where we once lived We all move across the creek The place that we call Sesame Street 